Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm really happy to be here, and I'm really happy to hear my name, second name, pronounced in the right way. That doesn't happen too often. Um, well, kudos to guys. Yes, the last two days I spent for the first time in my life uh, announcing another speakers, and I'm now extremely exhausted, so I prefer to be at stage and look at you. Uh, so, applause for guys, for all the support, for other speakers. You didn't expect it, yeah? Now, now you are the star. No pressure from my side. Uh, okay, so I will tell you, uh, I should introduce, my, introduce myself because I don't have introduction slide. So uh, I'm David, I come from Krakow, Poland, currently unemployed. Sounds like introduction to TV show. But um, anyway, I will tell you today something different than uh, testing and uh, quality assurance in general. Something that uh, is called test ops. Who has ever heard that kind of description? Test ops. Okay, I, I, I cannot really see you because there are lights, so I trust you somehow raise your hand. Uh, let's start. So every good presentation, as I have heard not so far ago, should start with smart sentence. Uh, I don't like to spend time to find any of them, so I put just my own. Which is not that smart, probably, but still. I see you are interested, you put your effort to read it, so uh, that's the result of this slide. Okay, so um, let me summarize or introduce you to what said Elliot. Uh, drawn as a classical model of software testing. So we have tests, then we have uh, system under tests, then we have analysis and quality assessments. And usually it's uh, black and white, so it pass or fail. We have exact results, we run the tests, we have results, and then it pass or fail. And you probably agree, that's uh, how the auto auto automation, test automation usually works. We have green, we have red, and we can estimate it later. But uh, times are changing now. So we have a much more dynamic world, we have much more changes, and everything is going much faster, in much faster pace. So uh, just interesting facts, everyone likes number, that's Facebook, with 2.77 million videos every minute, and 31 million messages every minute as well. Then Twitter, I like those big names because it puts your uh, attention, Twitter generates almost uh, 350 thousands of tweets per minute. Google provides results for over 1 billion search queries each day. And the last Amazon deploys new software to production every 11 seconds. Uh, so I've started a little bit getting deeper if Test ops is just my imagination, or maybe there are such terms uh, around the world. And yeah, I found some offers around the world. I posted here some more interesting. I don't know if there are still current. If yes, maybe uh, you want to look at these slides later. Uh, so the salary is in every of them, so that's, that's good. Um, and I even created my own some time ago. As you can see, those skills, uh, like Jenkins knowledge or continuous integration deployment, is not the subset of skills, skills of the normal QA. Usually it's uh, like kind of DevOps or maybe developer. But why not put it as a skill of tester? Why not put this responsibility into tester's hand? And uh, then Seth Elliott created another model, model called TestOps. And we have slightly different, so we still have system under tests, but instead of running tests, we have three components. The first of them is exposed users and systems, and actually it happens in all big corporations now. Now, for example, um, Google or Amazon deploy their product just for the subset of users, for example, 1%, and then just pull data from that, analyze, estimate, and make some decisions. Then we have production users and systems, so any monitoring system, for example, Kibana, or in general, ELK stack, I think most of you can know it, 
or even use it every day. And then we have test cases and monitors, and I will talk about it uh, more in the next slide. And then, instead of just pass and fail, we have KPIs. KPIs sounds like a very corporative way, but uh, even two presentations ago, I've seen like KPIs as a as a parameter to estimate quality, not pass and fail and number of uh, successful and not successful, but numbers that we can later analyze, like, for example, performance of the system. It's never just pass and fail. We have kind of threshold and we have uh, dynamic numbers changing over time. Now, how does it look like in general? So definitely, at first, we have continuous build. Whatever you use, whatever tool, whatever approach, uh, whatever kind of branching model you use, is usually more for developers, but probably if you work in big teams, uh, big, big automation teams, you take care about it as well. Then we have uh, validation. So something we, in general, call tests or test automation. Later, we have continuous delivery, so deploying something on the production. And as a last step, and it was never uh, like a couple of years ago in the area of interest of, of testers, is uh, continuous monitoring. And we have two items here. The first one is continuous, uh, the, the first one is like dynamic monitoring. So you can preview it in, at any time. You can use any tool. You have a lot of colors, a lot of charts, so everything that product people likes the most. Uh, and you have the second component, which is semantic or uh, synthetic monitoring. And what does it mean? So in general, it's running a subset of tests. Usually it's like smoke, sweet, or um, like the most important functionalities or risk-based uh, tests running periodically. So you run it, let's say, once per 10 minutes, and you do it on production. So yeah, like when I test, I do it on the production. And here it makes sense. You test uh, the health of the system, not really changing conditions, just running the, the main functionalities. OK, so that was very quick, because I don't have a lot of time to talk about DevOps. I want to show you the, the real examples. Uh, but what for me DevOps really means? So the first one, integration with DevOps infrastructure. Not creating DevOps infrastructure not man maintaining it, but combining your part of job with DevOps part of job. So not to exchange DevOps. I mean, you can do it, and then your salary probably will rise. Uh, but I suppose the more reasonable and uh, more interesting for the company is if you have enough competences to work with them very close. Then we have uh, which tests to run and when, so not just staging environment, as uh, probably the, the most popular one. But you can use production environments and run those subset of tests, or just monitoring part. And then we have uh, no need to stand up the whole system every time, like over and over again. Because again, we can use the real data, the real parameters, and then just analyze them and make some decisions. OK, so uh, why should we care? So I told you about test ops, what test, op test ops really is. But why should we care so much? Why should we put our effort? So usually it's getting out of comfort zone and putting into new area, learning totally new skills. Well, that's the future. Uh, so we want to do everything automatically. Yeah, Who's working with test automation or anything automation? OK, I, I see just like some shadows. Um, yeah, so that's that's what we do. That's the future uh, DevOps as a culture, not as a position. It's now the, the most popular. A lot of companies are trying to implement it. Uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery, that was popular even even earlier. Or continuous improvement. Yeah, that's uh, for as a human factor, so to improve people's skills. But those two, those elements. Uh, making everything in an automatic way, brings you the field to make bigger failures. So have you ever heard about false positives and negatives? I suppose yes. Is there anyone who have 
never heard about it? Come on, or I will not explain it. Good, one person. So I will. So that's it. Uh, in general, we have success and we expect failure. Or we have failure and we expect success. It's not good, but the good, like good and bad. The bad thing is, of course, we have bad results. But the good thing is that this result is always the same. So if we expect failure and there is success and it happens every time, it's probably less uh, hard to investigate it, to find the real reason, to find the factor, and so on. But there is something called flaky tests. Anyone have never heard about it? Yeah, so more people. Uh, flaky tests, and uh, I just came here. That's, 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 that's a funny story, because I, I couldn't find like my friends from the previous company in, in Krakow, so I just came here, and uh, they came here as well. So if you want to drink a beer, just go abroad. That's, that's the conclusion from this day. But uh, flaky tests, getting back to the presentation, is when your results are not deterministic. So you run tests like two times or more. And uh, for the first, you have success, and the second run gives you failure. So those results are generated not in a uh, consistent way. And usually, it's very hard to find the, the reason, to find the factor of the problem. Uh, there are solutions how to deal with that. For example, uh, Google, when implementing test automation, they always consider tests as not stable. They always consider tests as flaky. And they run it five or ten times. If these five or ten times give them the same result, they put it into test suite, into test automation suite. If not, then it's flaky. So they do not put it definitely. And uh, because of that, because of flaky tests, which comes because of a lot of automation, I want to show you this chart. It's a quite popular one. So how everything has changed. So we had Agile, like 2000, I think, three. You can correct me. Uh, the, the first uh, book. Then we had continuous integration, delivery, and everything extend the previous stages. And now we have DevOps. So we try to automate everything, starting from uh, implementation till the end. So it's not just release and deploy, but then we have operation, which means monitoring as well. And uh, from product perspective, it's like the more collaboration, the more value. It's obvious. We deliver software in a faster way. We get results faster. So we can sell our product uh, in a better way. But uh, I see it as a risk. So from one side, there is value. But from the second hand, there is risk as well. And I have more smart sentence. That's great author. You can Google him. Uh, the more automation, the more you do something in a continuous way, the more your risk to your project you put. And that's uh, the first thing why I brought this topic to you. Because the more independent, the more automation we have, the more risk we put into project. Then we have uh, something I called pains of high tech, usually not, not just high tech, but usually relates to high tech companies. And uh, the first one is lack of time. If some one of you have never experienced lack of time, just let me know. Uh, we can talk about unicorns and so on later. Uh, so what is the result because of that? We don't have usually proper methodology, like TDD, BDD, uh, unit tests. We have no documentation, or documentation is not consistent. And we have not enough resources. So for example, not enough testers, or not enough developers that put their time into testing. Then we have event-driven development. That's a dedication for guys from the previous company. Uh, so we create product to show off in some way, to present on uh, some events, to sell it to our 
customers or just to interest investors in that startup. And the last thing, chaotic environment with uh, very fast changing requirements. Actually, that's the main reason why DevOps culture is now happening, because we change our requirements very frequently and we expect results very quick as well. So that's uh, the second pain from my side. The first one is DevOps culture, and then we have those high-tech companies. And then we have the third one. You can know that. So we have time, we have quality, and we have money. And usually the game is like pick two of them. But let's not focus on price for now. Let's focus on quality and time, which is called pace and polish here. I found the name Unicorn Dilemma. That's why it's Unicorn here. Uh, so usually you cannot just combine those three of them. But now focus on speed and quality, because that's what DevOps is really about. So we have speed versus quality. And you can find a lot of articles on that how to deal with them, how to split effort, and so on. But why not to consider it as a speed and quality? Going parallel, going together, and trying to get results maybe not that spectacular, but faster and better. And I found something called quick wins. Who have ever heard this description, quick wins? That's good. So. Uh, it's not popular for testing. It's more for companies, usually startups, all those working in a fast-growing environment, fast-growing growing market, or just for uh, managers. So what does it mean? Usually we just want to put not a lot of effort and get quick results, instant, instant results. So we put some time and we get some advantage over, for example, our competitors immediately. So why not to put it into test automation? Why not to put it into quality assurance approach? So let's try to think about it. Let's try to think how we can use it, the quick wins approach, to improve our quality. So focusing on process, improve our quality. And I have three examples for you. Uh, this is the subset of tools I will operate on. It doesn't matter, it can be whatever. The more important are descriptions. So we have something for test management. We have uh, our collaboration. And as I know, Slack is now 90% of the market for that. We have something for monitoring and reporting, project management, and CI, CD. The first example, we usually don't have time for writing automation if something comes quick, if we want to give quick response, if the quality is good enough. Uh, so we had a lot of speeches about automation, we have a lot of uh, speeches about good automation, and the truth is that very often in reality we have no time for automation. So what does it mean? Like, it's a um, board from Zephyr, or, but it can be whatever. You can use any tool for test management. But uh, what is the problem for me? So if we want to deploy something and we change some components, usually it makes no sense to test everything. We want to ensure, be sure that uh, the product, those changes, are not influencing other components and are working itself. So let me draw it. We have test bucket, like everything put into, into one box. And uh, then we have test suites. Do you know how test suites are called in the fire? Who said that? OK, so I have uh, 10 euros for lunch for you. Just one. The second is for me. Uh, yeah, for some reason it's called test cycle. I cannot understand since a couple of years why the hell it's called test cycles. So I will stay with test suite convention. And then we have test cases for test suites. And let's say we have 
successful product because every product is successful. Yeah, that's that's why we work for the companies. We have some main components. It could be whatever. So let's say we have two mobile platforms, backend part and firmware part, which is software for hardware devices. And then we receive successful product for sure. But uh, then we have quick change. We have new feature from the customer. We have uh, some change from product people. And as always, it should be immediate. So let's say we have a bunch of test cases, naming like every letter. And usually, those test cases relate to some components. So uh, you have mobile application, for example, Facebook. And uh, some of them, some changes can relate just to mobile application. So some data is stored locally, uh, like for example, your cache. Some of them relate to backend as well. For example, changing picture. And some of them can relate to the whole system, for example, posting or recording videos or just making live stream. So every test case relates to one or more components. And what's more, we can add some labels for some reasons. And now we want to quickly know which of those, those tests should be executed, not all of them. And we want to get all those tests in a structured way to keep results for later and to execute it in a ma manual way. So let's say we have changed for iOS. So those three tests relates to iOS. And that's what we want to get. We want to just execute those three. We can do it easily. We can just look at all the uh, test cases and execute this, this, and this, or copy it manually. But I think we should do it in a better way. We should uh, allow our testers to do it by one click. So you click one, you choose which component, which version, and then you have prepared environment for quick execution of manual testing. For example, like that. Uh, Jenkins is a good tool because it's free. It's not very pretty. Uh, so for small companies, it's perfect. So what we want to set here is just the component. It's uh, product, uh, project name, because we, have, we can have more than one, and just version that was released or is going to be released, new deploy name. And then we can just execute it. And uh, all test cases under proper test suites that relates to uh, proper components are cloned. And we get everything ready to start execution. So by one click, we allow our manual testers to prepare environment, and they can start execution. So we don't have time spent on preparation. I would call it quick win. That's very fast to implement it. And we spare a lot of time. The second one, project workflow management. Uh, so what is the problem here? Let's say we have the most simple, like Kanban board, to do in progress done, and so on. Then we want to make it more complicated because we are a major company, because we want to track it in a better way. So we can add code review, uh, development ready, and for example, QA in progress. QA in progress, why it's useful? Because if you have, for example, multiple testers uh, distributed around the world, you don't want to allow two of them to do the same work because it makes no sense. So by that setting the proper process, you can avoid it. You can avoid just asking every time, hey, what are you doing now? Okay, I want this, you will take this, and you will take this. Better to set proper process. And now we have items to implement. It can be feature, it can be bug, it can be whatever you want. And we have development completed. And now the question is if we should start testing. Well, like logically, yeah, why not? But are we sure it's deployed somewhere? Or we have uh, APK build? Uh, 
I'm not sure that. So developer made his job, but the the uh, the image cannot be done. For example, because of continuous integration failure and so on. So the question here is if we should start testing. Usually, for me, the good the good answer is D. But if there is more complicated case, it's C. And uh, that was very painful. So if, if we have uh, frequent releases, probably you have to very often ask your developers if this image is already released, if there is any problem in our pipeline, and so on. Why not to add one more status and try to automate it? So why not to distinguish development ready and QA ready? Because development ready for me means like I did my job from the developer perspective, and from QA side, we have everything ready, including environment. Deployment on staging environment, production, it depends on your company culture. So this is how I see it. If we have a kind of uh, continuous integration or DevOps culture, if we, and we can, after every commit, for example, build our image, why not to, if it's successful, make a transition between those cases automatically. And then, of course, in parallel, we can run tests and so on. So we have those two cases. We have uh, bug, we have feature. Everyone knows that feature is just pretty bug. We're in a suite. And then we click red button. Red button like a Chinese, Chinese fabric which means it's uh, triggered by the previous stage, like for example, deploy to production. And we know that uh, this one, this guy is ready for retesting, and this one can be closed because it was not really the feature, but it was something that was done, uh, for example, from the operations perspective, and we don't really have to test it. Uh, was it the quick win? I think yes. We avoid a lot of miscommunication. We improve our process. We improve our uh, collaboration with others. And everything is going on automatically. We don't put too much time for the communication. I mean, it doesn't mean developers don't like to speak to you or communicate with you. Uh, maybe they are very talkative people. But I think it's better to solve it by processes. And the third case, mobile app handling. So let's say we have any uh, monitoring tool, logging system, and so on. Here, let's say it's Crashlytics. Anyone using Crashlytics? Yeah, quite a few of you. Uh, it can be Logstash as well and Kibana. It's up to the company. But we have some data here. So what is the important thing from here? Well, for the first, it's production. So we have results from our customers. And of course, it's monitoring, so if there are any problems, if there are alerts and so on, we know about it. But maybe we can use it in a little, bit, a li a little bit different way. So we have crashes, usually. But uh, do we really need to fix all of them? Maybe we have a hundred of crashes. And th then the question is, if we have one user that has hundreds of crashes, or we have hundreds of users with just one crash. The second option probably won't hurt you so much because it's like once per time. Well, yeah, that's acceptable. But if you have customer crashing every time or over and over again, um, you will get negative feedback, probably negative uh, review, and a lot of bad p uh, a lot of bad marketing from uh, from your customers. So uh, we have a lot of data. We have, uh, we have uh, crash for recessions. We have a uh, uh, number of bugs, number of people affected, number of devices, and so on. So let's use some data. Let's use this data and make some actions. Uh, so let's do it. Yeah, quite a lot of text, yeah. Uh, so what is the most important? Because probably it's not up to, up to you, really. But you can trigger that process. So, what does it mean? Let's say we have a bunch of uh, crashes, and our problem is when one of the customers, or more of the customers, has 20 bucks per 
month or two bucks per day. Uh, I don't really care about the statistics. I don't care what kind of uh, numbers, which numbers exactly I should put here. But I really care if the quality is bad and uh, some users are affected by a lot of, a lot of crashes. So again, like we have some, some flow. So again, we have Jenkins or any CI tool. Then we have executed jobs uh, and we have tests in parallel, but maybe we can pull some data like from Chrysalix or Kibana or whatever. And then using the data, we can do three things. The first one is to present it in a graphic way. And that's what ELK stash allows you to do. And that's very popular now. But the second thing can be if we have, uh, if our threshold that we set and the number of crashes is higher, we can create defect in an automatic way. So we don't have to review it day by day and then or wait just for alerts, but we can prepare our own query and we can report if something will go wrong. And what's more, we can use collaboration tool to notify it in a quick way. So yeah, creating bug in Jira is a good way, but much better is if your product people see it as well, not just developers. Probably you will get, uh, the action will be made much faster. Yeah, so we have uh, bugs created in that way. We can set priority. Mm. I lost it, yeah. It's here, the big red one. Uh, we can set priority, we can uh, create title, put some data, and so on. But the most important, we have bugs already created with enough data. So we have created bug, but the problem is if the same case will happen again. Because we can fix bug, then we can have half a year. Uh, yeah, this author, I recommended it. So if, if you do not believe you have another smart sentence. Uh, so we have bug, and after half a year, after a year, the same problem will return, or just can return. And there is a nice, nice, it's not GIF, but it's just the truth. Uh, so we make fix, and then another problem just, just happen. Or usually it's more problems than we have. So the conclusion is, after some time, the same thing can happen and we will lose data that was in the past. But if we have created bug, we can just reopen it. Uh, and this is like notifications for the product people and for the uh, developers. And some of them can be just reopened. There's a signal that something went very wrong because that same thing is happening again. And the third part is just to present it in a good, graphic way. That can be Kibana, that can be whatever you want. But it's quite popular now. Okay, so we have a lot of uh, things done. We take care about process as well, about improving processes in a like quick wins way. So not a lot of effort, immediate results, that has value. Uh, so we do everything, yeah? So what is the role of developer in that case? Who agree with that? That's good no one raised his hand because for me, the role of developers won't change in any way. They still should ca take care of uh, unit tests. They still should talk about quality itself. And what we do is just improving the, the process to gain to achieve better quality. So it's for the whole company, not to remove developers job. So let's summary. Let's uh, let's summarize. The first thing, test ops is quite unique approach. Uh, it's not like this, the the standard model of of uh, test automation of testing approach, but it gives you much more results and much more more fluent data. And uh, that was already summarized. That. DeskTops is not creating infrastructure from the beginning, but it's more to use your part to integrate with what you already implemented at your company, hopefully. 
then don't focus on just tools. And I think you can see it on almost every presentation. Don't care about tools. Think about the problem. And the same here. No difference. Don't take too much care about tool. Uh, just focus to solve the problem, and then you can choose the right tool. Continuous improvement. So you have seen a lot of continuous things. There was no continuous improvement mentioned. But definitely, you should put your time in that. So if you have some spare time, like, of course, no one has spare or free time especially testers. But uh, maybe it's much better to invest just a small amount of time to get results, instant results, and improve your quality. And think about quick wins approach. I think you have never heard, uh, never thought about it, even if you heard about it. Oh, maybe it's time to make some retrospection and think what can we do in a quick way which is not really test automation or testing, but will improve our quality. And the last thing, and uh, I, I suppose that's the fundamental for all the testers. So explore and investigate. Thanks. <laughs>